Well, hello and welcome. This is Matthew, and today I am excited to introduce, uh, alongside Moshix from the Moshix Mainframe channel, our new project and free service for the mainframe hobbyist community, uh, and that is a virtual 1403 printer. So if you haven't seen Moshix's video on this yet, uh, which I will link in the description down below with uh, his tutorial and setup information and some of the motivation for this, uh, let's start with a quick demo. So I'm going to log into my MVS 3.8 uh, mainframe here, running under Hercules. And uh, let's go ahead and run a job. I've been, uh, I've actually been playing with uh, Kix. Uh, that's our free Kix with a K recently, um, uh, trying to build an application. So I have a uh, set of JCL here that builds up all of my maps and a little COBOL program. Uh, and all of the other aspects you need to build a Kix program. Uh, but that's not what this is about. This is just going to give us a bunch of printer output, uh, some printer listings from this job. And you'll see on my mainframe, I've set up a new output class called C. And for me, the C output class goes to a printer that uh, does something a little special. So let's go ahead and submit this job. Okay, that job is submitted. Now, if I go and check my mail, let's refresh that here. Oh yeah, it just came in. Uh, so I just received an email and this email is from my virtual 1403 printer and it has a PDF attached. So let's go ahead and open that PDF uh, and let's actually open it up in something other than the Gmail viewer here. And you can see I've received the listing from that job as a PDF. Uh, delivered by email. And that all happened pretty quickly, uh, just a few seconds after I uh, submitted that job to my mainframe. And if you want to take a look at the PDF, you can see it's uh, sort of that classic green bar look. Uh, we're using the the 1403 vintage font. Uh, Moshix, as part of providing the service to the community, got in touch with uh, the company, the author of that font, and licensed it for the uh, the use that we're using it for here. And I, I hope you'll agree that the page and just everything about this uh, is, is a very high quality and a lot of detail that uh, I don't think we've seen before in some of these, you know, kind of virtual mainframe green bar uh, printer output programs. Uh, Moshix and I really wanted to focus on a 1403 printer, accurately emulating it, uh, and choosing a common... Uh, green bar paper, the tractor feed paper uh, template uh, that would have been common in the era back when the 1403 was a dominant printer. So we'll get into details of that uh, in this video. But again, if you want some more information about this project and how to set it up on the TK4- system that I know a lot of the community is using, uh, again, check out the video down in the description. I'll have a link to Moshix's video walking through uh, the setup of this on, uh, on the TK4 system. So that's what we're working on. Uh, let me show you something else about this uh, that you might not just see from you know this big long listing. Uh, but another thing we wanted to get right was kind of the carriage control and support some of the, uh, I guess, tricks you could call them <laughs> that applications might use uh, to uh, to create some text effects on just a simple, you know, monospaced, one font, capital letter only line printer. So let's close that listing, and we will file that message away. Uh, I have another job here on my mainframe to demonstrate some of the other capabilities, uh, and it's a Fortran job. And the reason it is a Fortran job, let me find it here. Yep, learning JCL. Uh, here we go. Run Fortran. Is if you're familiar with uh, the Fortran format, basically its ability to write output, uh, it has these extra carriage control uh, characters or bytes at the beginning of the text that you're printing. So if you put a one here. Uh, that tells Fortran that when it's printing that out to a printer, uh, to the printer listing, to begin a new page. If it's blank, it just prints this line on the next page of the printout. Uh, if you put a plus here, it says don't advance 
the printer by a line when you print this line. Uh, so basically do a carriage return so the print head moves back to the beginning of the line. Uh, of course, a 1403 doesn't have a print head. It's, it's, uh, it has a print chain, so it essentially tries to uh, print the whole line at a time as quickly as it can. That's how it can just spew paper out so quickly. Uh, but essentially, think of it as the print head. Uh, it'll actually just move the print head back over the previous line that it printed and then print the new line. So you can do things like take your zeros and print a slash through them by printing them out. Um, doing a new, uh, uh, sorry, a carriage return, but not a line feed, and then over striking the top of them. So we'll see how that works. You can create an underline effect the same way by uh, over striking the previous line. But in this case, I'm over striking with the underbar character. So it should come out underlined on the page. You can do that with deletions by striking through with uh, the hyphens. And you can even do, uh, again, just sort of basic text effects. Uh, if you say, we can create bold text by overstriking. And then if you overstrike the text, bold text in this case, with the same letters, uh, because you're having the printer impact those letters uh, on the print ribbon uh, twice, or perhaps even more than twice, uh, over that same text, it's going to make it a little bit heavier. It's going to make it a little bolder. Uh, and then again, with a uh, zero, I believe that's the emit a, a new page, do a page feed or a form feed, uh, and then we'll print this on the next line. So let's go ahead and run that job. Again, this is obviously just a silly program, but uh, it does demonstrate uh, that the form feed and carriage return and uh, line feed control characters are all being processed properly. So we will submit that. We'll go watch our email inbox here. There it is. And if I look at this PDF, let's open this in something we can zoom in. We'll get past the uh, the standard just to output. And uh, here's our Fortran output. So I'll zoom in on this a little so you can see it. Uh, so this was just the normal text we printed. And then we printed a line with a form feed. So that takes us to the next page. And here's where you can see some of that carriage control uh, taking effect. Remember, we printed the line of zeros, and then we said carriage return but not form feed. And then we printed five of these forward slashes. And sure enough, they're appearing over top of the zeros from the previous line. Similarly, you can see that underline effect. You can see the strikeout effect. And you can see the bold text that was created by overstriking that same text. So if we zoom in quite a bit here, uh, even in the YouTube video, it should be pretty uh, pretty apparent that we have been able to simulate a bold text effect uh, through that overstrike mechanism. And that's how it would have been done on a real printer if you wanted to create some of these uh, text effects on a printer that obviously you couldn't uh, you know, load fonts to from the computer. The print chain and the characters on the print chain were just whatever were physically installed in the printer. So that's what this project does. You get uh, what I think is, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, a, a very nicely uh, drawn background on the page. And thanks to uh, Moshik's providing the service, he's running the server, he paid for the cost of the font and uh, running the cloud server that this is all running on. Uh, this, is, excuse me, this is accessible to all of us. Uh, by just signing up for an account over on the uh, the virtual server. Again, I'll link to that down below. It's 1403.bitnet.systems. And we have this uh, this fun little project that we can use and print out all of our, uh, our mainframe listings. So while we're looking at this page, uh, part of the genesis of this project was when Moshex contacted me with the idea, and he said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there were a service where somebody could get these really nice printout listings uh, just online, delivered to them via email, right? They run a job on their mainframe and the, the pages come to them. And Moshix has a collection of 1403 printouts uh, from, I believe, the early 80s, uh, back sort of the appropriate era when all of this stuff was in use absolutely everywhere. So he sent me, I think I have them loaded here. Yeah, so he sent me some uh, some photos he had of his uh, of his listings. And what we decided to do was, uh, again, just really focus on recreating a particular form 
uh, a particular type of paper stock. Uh, and then of course the 1403, uh, since we're lucky to have that vintage 1403 font uh, that Slanted Hill recreated. And so if you look at these printouts, you can uh, you can obviously see you know sort of where I got the uh, the template from. And it's thanks to Moshix's printouts here that we were able to reproduce this uh, to the accuracy that uh, that we have, and that I, I don't think we've seen in the uh, kind of virtual hobbyist uh, PDF printers before. Uh, the other thing that we noticed is while the pages, uh, there are 66 printable lines on a page, right? That's starting all the way at the top. If you print it on the first line all the way down to the bottom line, you get 66 possible lines. Uh, and it's a six line per inch uh, character set print chain that would have typically been loaded into this printer. Although you'll notice the paper stock has uh, more numbers for the line numbers on the right side than it does on the left side. So this paper might have been used in either a six line per inch setup or an eight line per inch setup, and you just bought the same paper. And then if you needed to refer to line numbers, you referred either to the uh, more densely packed line numbers if you were in an eight line per inch setup uh, versus the line numbers that are a little bit uh, more spread around or spread apart. Uh, so again, all those little details recreated in our printouts. Uh, here's just close-up detail of what that left margin line numbering looks like. Uh, you can see that for the production of the paper, right, this would have been used at the paper factory, the fiducial mark for them to align the uh, their hole punch dies with the printed page. You can see some of the alignment marks here for the print area alignment marks that uh, maybe the operator would have used to get the paper aligned correctly in the printer. And there's even a little, uh, you can see it on the other side here, but down at the bottom, here we go. Yeah, so there's uh, there's just this number one printed on every page. You can see it on the next page, printed in the background there. Um, so I'm not sure what this one indicated. I'm wondering if you got uh, maybe multi-part forms, right? So carbon copy or uh, you know stacked carbonless uh, versions of this paper. Uh, maybe they would indicate, you know, one for the first copy, two for the second copy, and so on, however many copies uh, were in the carbon copy stack, um, so that you can track those. Uh, that's just a guess. I, I have no idea. Maybe someone who uh, was a an operator back in the time, had a 1403 printer, has more insight on that and can comment. Uh, but it's another detail we wanted to reproduce, right? We wanted this to be uh, accurate. Uh, so as I went about designing the PDF template, um, uh, kind of the drawing commands, just all the vector drawing commands to draw this background on the PDF pages, I started appropriately enough by planning it out on paper. Um, so you can just see here, uh, if you look at the code, you'll see that the PDF library uses points for distance. So a one point is one seventy second of an inch, uh, and that's just the basis from which I uh, kind of planned everything out, the relative distances of everything. We counted the number of holes on a page, uh, even little details like the first hole uh, on the page and the last hole on the page are slightly larger than all of the middle holes. Uh, so I've recreated that. And then I tried to recreate that one outline. Uh, I just kind of had to guess that, okay, what what makes it look like the proportions are correct to, to visually look like that one? And you'll notice that while it's mostly straight lines, there's a little curve here along the top, and then a slightly different curve uh, in the little, uh, whatever you call this, the flag part of the one here. Uh, so again, just trying to draw that on a grid and then translate into Bezier curves and uh, vector drawing commands for the PDF uh, itself. And again, if you look at the output, um, I think it's pretty accurate. Uh, we have a little form part number here. Uh, so that's uh, that's the output we achieved. The other decision I, I made was in a lot of the previous uh, sort of utilities and attempts to do this, I noticed that the tractor feed holes were often uh, just black circles. And when I tried that, I found it just really visually distracting, right? Having that much, uh, you know, black ink, uh, obviously it's not ink, but virtual ink uh, on the page, uh, much of the weight of the page ended up being 
in the tractor feed holes. And it really drew the eye away from the text, the content of the listing. And again, if you're looking at real listings, you know, the holes aren't just black. They're going to be, uh, you know, unless they're sitting on a black desk, uh, they're going to be just showing what's behind it. You might have a stack of them. And so you, you know, you might see kind of the white edges of paper uh, if it's all folded up um, and, and you haven't unfolded it to read the individual pages. So regardless, you know, that's just a, a style decision that uh, I think uh, lets you keep sort of the nice uh, authenticity of the, the green bar background, uh, but your eye is able to focus on the text because after all, the point of this is that you can actually read through your listings, uh, check for the status of your jobs and, you know, find any errors that they may be reporting. And of course, see the output of whatever programs you're running. So enough about the design there. Uh, let's hop over to the code. Uh, this is all an open source project. So the uh, the project itself is all up in my GitHub under virtual 1403. And I tried to make the whole uh, program and the components of the program pretty modular. So the web server, so that's what accepts the job from the agent running on your local uh, your local system that's talking to Hercules, um, right? That's a standalone web server. If you wanted to run your own web server, you can do that. Uh, and that's just a standalone Go program that, uh, that runs this web service here. And the agent, this is what you run on your computer. So I have that running in my terminal over here. Uh, so it's a binary. We have pre-compiled binaries up on the GitHub releases for uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, and then a couple of architectures for Linux and Mac, both the uh, Intel and ARM architectures. So you can download that agent. Uh, you configure it to uh, point to your Hercules socket printer and our uh, web server up in the cloud. And then it just does its work. It listens for the printer output from Hercules. It sends the print job up to the web service. And as you saw, you get the email a couple of seconds later. Um, and so all the source code for that agent is here. And then there's the virtual printer itself. Uh, so this is really where that PDF background is and where the behavioral characteristics of the 1403 printer live. So. Uh, one of the things that we noticed, and actually, let me let me go back over to, uh, let's see, the, one of the printouts here. Yeah. So even though there are 66 printable lines on the page, if you start at the top and go all the way to the bottom, we noticed in the printouts that Moshix has that for the jobs coming from, uh, you know, it was clearly an MVS system uh, running Jez2 as its uh, scheduler and spooler, the printer was configured such that when it hit the end of the page, it would advance to the sixth line of the next page uh, and then pick up printing from there. So again, whenever it ran past the end of the page, even though it's you know this would have been attached, it's just continuous feed paper, it could have just picked up and kept printing lines uh, you know right right here at the top of the page. Uh, it would go down six lines, resume printing. And then it can print all the way, uh, if I have a, yeah, it can print all the way to the bottom of the page. And then again, it would skip to the sixth line and pick up there, which for this paper template, uh, right, in a way that explains why this paper template starts the way it does. If you look at the pictures, there are no green bars for the first, uh, the first inch, the first six lines of the page. Um, sorry, let me find the pictures again. If we go back to one of the full page printouts, yeah, there we go. Um, right, it's not just green bar, white bar, green bar, it's blank. And then the the green bar, uh, you know, line numbered area picks up below. And in combination with this, this printer setup of skipping down to the sixth line, uh, it's kind of nice because after a form feed, you can always put your title line. So you just do a form feed, get to a new page, you get a title line that sits outside of the numbered rows, uh, and then you have your numbered rows of, uh, again, right, normally, or another use of all these printers would just be printing out a lot of uh, a lot of reports, right? Those might be tables of sales figures or 
you know, payroll data or whatever the case may be, right? Every, you know, businesses used mainframes for all of their operations. Uh, so you end up with your, uh, your title and then the data, uh, will always be in the, the green barred numbered portion so that you can easily refer to line numbers and read across in your eye because of this alternating, uh, row coloration and the lines. It helps your eye track across, uh, this wide text, uh, so that you can follow along. So again, we decided we're going to focus on uh, really accurately emulating one particular setup. Uh, and right now, that's the 1403 with this kind of form control. Uh, one of these things about the 1403 printer is that it actually had a little paper punched tape, and that's how it did form control. So every time the printer would move to the next line, if it got a line feed character, it would uh, essentially advance the carriage until uh, it hit the next uh, hole, the next punched hole in its form control tape. Uh, so essentially for this setup, it would have a form control tape that, um, I don't know if it was one-to-one -one real, uh, you know, real length with the, the height of the printed page, or if it did a couple of loops for efficiency, however it worked, uh, you would have this tape that had essentially uh, probably five positions that were not punched so the printer wouldn't stop advancing and then you would have the next 61 positions that were punched and that's just how the printer knew where you wanted it to stop each time so if you had a custom form loaded maybe your sales invoice form and it had a couple lines at the top for the customer information and then it skipped a few lines and then it had a couple of lines for invoice line items right whatever that custom form that you had uh, you know printed by a print shop to make you your custom continuous form paper uh, with your company logo printed on it and maybe stuff like that you could also make or have made the form control tape uh, punched tape that had the printer line positions in the correct place for your form. So, uh, you know, the sky was the limit in terms of how you wanted to set up your printer. Uh, there was also form control buffer support over on the mainframe side. So Jez 2 could be synchronized and understand how your printer was set up. Uh, so what we have here is again, just kind of a generic, uh, but very typical setup for uh, this particular paper template, which is skip down to the sixth line on every new page. And then you're allowed to print all the way to the bottom of the page. And then as you roll over to the next page, skip down to that title line again. So all of that logic is uh, sort of encapsulated in this implementation of a virtual 1403 printer. Uh, and because this is all open source, if you wanted to come in and change the printer characteristics, uh, sort of change the line that you roll over to, uh, you can see you can change the color. I think I just have some constants here. Yeah, so sort of the dark green color and the light green color. You could make blue bar paper. You could make paper that doesn't have any background at all. Um, and that's one of the things we may do with this, uh, time permitting uh, going forward, is, uh, you know, making different background drawings, right? Different paper stock uh, that maybe is just, right, the plain alternating green bar starting at the top of the page, uh, you know, maybe without line numbers. Uh, again, it's just code. You're just drawing in a PDF library. Um, so really you can, you know, you can make your virtual printer behave however you want. Uh, but this is the background as it is. Uh, you can see this is the uh, just kind of drawing that one in the the lower right of the page. Again, it's mostly just lines with a couple of curves. Uh, here's filling in the green bars. Uh, little details like the vertical lines are slightly lighter than the horizontal lines. Um, so that's that's the implementation there of uh, how that background is drawn. And then the last piece is the scanner. Uh, so the scanner, this is what actually reads the printer, uh, basically the byte stream from Hercules and translates it into lines that we want to print in the PDF. Uh, so it's a little uh, stateful, uh, basically it's a little state machine. Uh, we just read one character at a time and based on that character, we either add it to the line or if it's a line feed or a form feed or a carriage return, uh, we take the appropriate action to tell the virtual printer what we want it to do. 
And this has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, when I was creating this, I was effectively just basing it on the output from my MVS 3.8 system. And based on that assumption, uh, we end up with the assumption that I can determine the end of a job and pull certain job details out of it, like the job number and the job name, uh, from a single sort of end of job line that MVS gives us on the uh, on the separator page at the end of the job, right? So this line right here both tells me um, when I see this line followed by a form feed, I know that we're at the end of the job. And you can see there's some useful info here, job number and the job name that was in my JCL job card. Uh, so that's all done by this little um, Lexer parser thing. Uh, just having enough state to look back one line, and I can run a regular expression on that. We can uh, take out some of the submatches and build the end of job information that way. So we got that all working. Um, I was running it. I was printing jobs out. I was happy. It was working great. I sent Moshix a test copy of this, and he tried it with uh, VM370. And it turns out VM370 doesn't print nice end of job uh, indications. It doesn't even actually perform a form feed at the end of a job. It just stops printing in the middle of the page. And it's not until it has the next job uh, that it will advance uh, the paper out so you can tear off the previous job and uh, start printing the next job. Um, and it doesn't have a separator page at the end of the job at all. It only puts them at the beginning of the job. I think that changed in later versions of uh, VM. Uh, but even then, it doesn't have just a single end of line, uh, sort of end of job uh, line that you can pull data out of. So that's a weakness right now. Um, you saw in my jobs, I actually get the job information in the file name. Uh, if I print from VM, I'm not going to get that. I'm just going to get a timestamp. And fixing that would probably require pretty much an entire rewrite of how I'm doing um, this parser and scanning the output. Um, so it works because we just say, OK, if the agent doesn't get data for half a second, consider it the end of the job. Um, so if you print a job from VM370, it'll print. And then after the half second when you're between jobs and it's not printing, we'll go ahead and say, ah, that's the end of the job. The agent will send the print job up. We'll get the PDF sent to you. Um, but it's it's not going to have that job detail. So if anyone has ideas on how to more generally handle this, um, you know, I know uh, Fish's Hercprint product, uh, which I've not personally used because I don't use Windows and it's only for Windows. Um, uh, but otherwise, I've uh, I, I think a lot of people really use it and enjoy it, and, and it's a it's a great little virtual printer product. Um, I know he has a pretty uh, comprehensive sort of page set up page description configuration format uh, to find you know what a separator page looks like, where on the page, which lines to pull certain information from. Uh, this is a, a much simpler approach. Um, and I was hoping to be able to stick with the much simpler approach. But because the different mainframe operating systems just do so many different things, and they're not all as convenient from a programmer's perspective as uh, MVS is, uh, if you know, if, if you really want this to work the same way it works for MVS with other mainframe operating systems, uh, you know, feel free to take a look at the agent and and see if you can do something about that. Um, another interesting thing is the the code page and character support. Right, there are some characters that tend to be used in mainframes. Um, sort of the logical not character. Make this a little bigger. Um, the sense character, and. Uh, Hercules' default output mapping for its printer, it does map from EBCDIC to ASCII, but it's not its not a particular ASCII mapping. Like, it's not ISO 88591. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a code set that I recognized, um, but it is in the Hercules source code. You can see the entire um, output mapping. So this, the EBCDIC characters are in the comments here, and then the equivalent ASCII characters it's spitting out uh, are in the body of this array. So for a couple of the common ones, as I came across them, uh, I have, uh, I've built the mappings here. Obviously, the right way to do this is just to go ahead and build the comprehensive mapping of every character to every other character. Um, 
uh, in the go source code here. So that's kind of a to do. But again, I think the common characters that would tend to be used in mainframe jobs are are covered here. So if you want to take a look at that, if you want to uh, you know maybe contribute to the project, feel free to take a look at how all of this works. Uh, and again, this project is very modular, right? You don't have to use uh, the agent that I wrote at all. Uh, if you look at the web server, the print job, I'm sorry, the web server itself, the code is kind of chaotic. I'm happy with the code of the other components, but I'm not really a, a front end uh, web development guy. And uh, while the little, the print web service here, uh, I would say the code is good. <laughs> the actual web UI code that, that runs the website here, uh, it's, it's a little bit chaotic, but I'm okay with that. It works. Um, sorry, where was I? Just lost my train of thought. Uh, GitHub, here we are. Um, so yeah, I was saying you don't need to use the agent uh, that comes with this project. If you look at this printjob.go file, uh, I've documented the protocol, basically the HTTP post that the agent makes. Uh, and there are just a couple of requirements here, right? You have your, your API key to identify the user. There's a content type. Uh, we compress it all with the Z standard compression algorithm. Uh, but then it's basically just lines of data. You send up lines you want printed, um, the overstrike lines, if you wanted to overstrike those, uh, page breaks, and then at the end of the job, or actually anywhere in the job, you can have the job data, which is what we put into the, um, the file name there. Uh, and then different kind of error conditions you can hit, or if it works, it's okay. So if you had really anything, uh, you can just implement sort of the simple text protocol uh, to submit an HTTP post to your account on the web service, and uh, you'll get emailed that PDF with all the same capabilities that we have for those mainframe printouts. Similarly, and I know I'm just kind of rambling at this point in the video, so I'll, I'll make this the last thing, um, but in addition to the web service, uh, let me go over to the agent here. Uh, so if you download the agent from GitHub, uh, which you can do by obviously looking at the code, um, you can also, uh, if you don't want to compile it yourself, you go to our releases here, and we have pre-compiled binaries for, again, a couple uh, architectures on Linux, a couple architectures on Mac OS, uh, and then Windows here. When you download that, you get a, uh, a folder with obviously the binary for your platform. Um, there's a readme with some uh, setup instructions for that, and it has a config file. So if I look at my config.yaml file, you can see here's how you point it to your Hercules uh, sock dev printer. Uh, and again, if you want to see how to set this up on the Hercules side really quickly and easily for MVS, uh, go check out Moshix's video, uh, which I'll link to down below. Uh, but we also have online or local mode. So in online mode, this is where you put in uh, the particular web server you want to uh, use to submit the jobs to and send you the email, and then your personal uh, private access key for the server. Uh, of course, this access key will no longer be valid by the time this video goes live. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the features of the uh, of the web service is uh, it gives you the configuration, so you can just paste this into a config file and you're ready to go. Uh, but if your access key is somehow compromised, right, you show it on a YouTube video to the world or whatever the case may be, uh, you can actually just generate a new access key and we will uh, delete the old one, invalidate the old one. It won't work anymore. It won't be associated with your account anymore. And then you just have a new access key. Um, so you can do that as many times as you want. <laughs> uh, but yeah, normally you'll just have your access key and you'll probably use it for life. Um, but just so you're aware, that's that's what that new access key thing is all about. Um, but as I was saying, it has an offline or a local mode. Um, so if you, you know, if you don't really care about getting the listings by email, uh, you can just have the agent locally. Uh, it has that same virtual printer code uh, compiled into it. Uh, it can just write it out to a directory, so a PDFs directory. And you can use whatever font you want. Again, that virtual 1403 font, or the 1403 vintage font that we're using is a commercial font. You have to buy that. Um, but if you don't have that font, uh, I've actually included an open source uh, IBM Plex mono font in the agent. Uh, so if I change this to local mode, 
And again, you can see we're going to the uh, PDF's output directory, and I'm not specifying a custom font. This line is just commented out. Uh, let's go ahead and restart the agent here. Should reconnect to Hercules. Yep. And you can see here, uh, we're going to create PDFs in the directory PDFs, and we're going to use the default font. So if I go back and print again, um, let's use that COBOL compile job. There we go. We should see that, uh, yep, we went ahead and wrote 61 page PDF to this location. Let's make a new tab here and go to the PDFs directory. And let's open that up uh, just back in our browser. So here you go. So there's Omni local file system, um, no online services involved. I have that same style of printout, the same template. The only difference is this isn't using the 1403 font. This is using uh, IBM Plex, uh, Plex Sans Mono, IBM Plex Mono, uh, whatever their, their IBM uh, monospace font is called. This is actually the font I use as my terminal font on everything. So I, uh, I really like this font. Um, but again, you have options there. Um, if you do happen to have the 1403 vintage font or a 1403 looking font uh, in the uh, in the README, there's some information about uh, using your own font. Again, you just you just point your config file to it. Um, but there is uh, there are some restrictions. The PDF librarian Go um, requires like I think it supports open type fonts, but they have to be true type outlines or postscript outlines or something. Um, but I found a web page that essentially um, tells you just using the free font forge program, uh, you can essentially open up the font file you have and then save it back out as a true type font. Uh, and then it will work with the PDF library that uh, I used to um, draw those PDFs from Go. So something you can play with, uh, again, if you just want to run it locally and not use the web service. Um, but the nice thing about the web service is uh, it's out there. It uses the nice, authentic 1403 vintage font, uh, and it's pretty cool. Just you know, no matter uh, where you're accessing your mainframe from, uh, you can just get those jobs emailed to you, and they arrive right in your. Uh, if I can find my inbox again, uh, they arrive right in your inbox. So I think I will uh, leave it there. Um, Again, this is just, it's been a fun project to work on. I'm glad Moshix came to me with this idea uh, and was able to collaborate with me on, uh, you know, really looking at, okay, how can we make this, uh, you know, pretty authentic and just, again, getting the details of, of all those pages uh, that he had printed out and and make this uh, kind of the nice template that it turned into. Um, all the source code is available uh, up in GitHub. Uh, I'll link to that below as well. Um, it's all written in Go, so if you want to sort of see how a Go project like this is put together, uh, again, I would claim, uh, obviously I'm biased, but I would claim <laughs> that the project uh, is pretty well put together in terms of the code and the layout of everything, uh, except the web server, which is pretty haphazard. Um, at first, I just made the API call for the printout, which uh, I'm happy with that code. But then I realized, oh, I have to build a bunch of UI pages and handle form submission and all of that. Um, I would probably use uh, like one of the Go web frameworks uh, to do that if I were to, uh, to do it all again. Uh, but for now, it's all just direct, just Go's built-in HTTP handler. Uh, and then every um, you know, every endpoint uh, is just implemented using the standard uh, Go HTTP handler stuff. So again, it's not bad. It's just uh, most most projects I do, uh, web service projects and everything, I end up organizing a little better and uh, uh, and using some frameworks just so that you have some nice uh, convenience utility methods and everything. Anyway, that's all I have today. I hope you enjoy that. Um, have fun using the service. If you run into problems, again, we know there's some problems with uh, in particular page alignment and uh, you know getting job info from uh, VM uh, spool output in particular. Um, MVS and its descendants should work uh, really nicely and all the pages should align right. Again, we, we sort of were using this template of JES2 output on a 1403 that had this particular uh, sort of carriage control set up. So, uh, you know, that's where you see these nicely aligned sort of perfect PDFs. Um, once you get into the actual data from VM printouts, it's fine, but uh, you'll notice like the, 
the uh, separator page on a, uh, a VM printout is going to kind of cross some page boundaries. And uh, it, it's not quite as clean, but again, it works. I still like the output. Uh, I'm not too bothered by it. But if, uh, if you sort of know how, or I should say, if you know what assumptions VM tended to make about printers, uh, uh, I'd be interested in hearing from you because when I look at it, it doesn't quite make sense, right? It's like in some parts, it looks like it assumes there are less than 66 printable lines, um, you know, assuming that it doesn't have the five line skip that it actually just starts at the beginning, but in other places, it looks like there's more. So if you're into printing from VM, uh, give this a try and let me know if there are things we can do to make it better. Uh, but in the meantime, have fun with it. Check the links below if you want to give it a try. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching. And we'll see you next time.